Thank you, Mike. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> we are, uh, I'd also like to welcome you to the Oscar Miller Day. We're very thrilled to have everyone here. We got a really a fantastic program. We have a record number of registered participants today. So um, hopefully this is going to be a fun, interactive, and educational day for everybody. So before we get started, I wanted to give you a little bit of background information on our research institute, uh, without which this, uh, this day would not be possible. So the Ortho Carolina Research Institute, or OCRI, whose mission is to advance and improve orthopedic health care. It's a nonprofit organization, a 501c3, and its structure, just like any other major organization, has a board of directors, managerial level, and support staff. Well, in 2013, we've been busy. We have uh, 20 investigational sponsored studies, 123 investigator initiated outcome studies. Uh, we've had numerous uh, studies and papers accepted at national and international meetings in a variety of subspecialties. We've had 12 publications to date in 2013 and 19 peer reviewed publications in 2012. Oakry does a, a number of uh, events uh, throughout the year, uh, not only Oscar Miller Day. Uh, last year was uh, our first injury prevention across sports uh, with science, the, the IPASS charity event, uh, with uh, Joe Theismann as our keynote speaker. This event was uh, an over overwhelming success, and uh, we'll hope to follow that up uh, this winter with another event. So you can uh, uh, keep an eye on that event and others that, uh, that uh, Oakry uh, hosts and sponsors throughout the year. Uh, you can follow us on uh, www.orthocarolinaresearch.org. Well, I wanted to give you a little bit of rundown on today's program. Uh, we'll have five sessions, uh, three in the morning and two after lunch. We'll begin with shoulder instability, then rotator cuff, and then we'll discuss athletic shoulder and elbow conditions. And then in the afternoon, we'll discuss shoulder arthritis and trauma. We'll cover a wide gamut of shoulder conditions and pathology, and we've also sprinkled in some elbow talks as well. Again, I'm Natty Hammett. Shad Schiffer and I are co-chairs for today's event, and the physicians at the uh, Ortho Carolina Shoulder and Elbow Center will serve as the faculty for today. Uh, they'll be giving presentations, uh, serve on the uh, uh, panels for discussion, and they'll be moderating the sessions. We're very privileged to have two truly world-class uh, keynote speakers today. We have Dr. Matt Preventure, who will be giving uh, uh, two talks in the morning on uh, athletic shoulder and elbow conditions. Uh, Dr. Matt Preventure is from Mass General Hospital. And we have Dr. John Sperling uh, from Mayo Clinic, who will be uh, giving us a uh, keynote talk uh, in the afternoon on shoulder arthroplasty. Well, our goals today, well, we want to provide you with some informative presentations but we also want to have some interactive Q&A sessions. We've specifically built time into the program to allow for questions from the audience, uh, also for panel discussions, and, and we're going to also present some unique cases throughout the day as well. So we want this to be interactive, so please come to the microphone and, and ask the, the uh, speakers your questions. We're hoping that today you'll have a further understanding after sh of shoulder and elbow conditions. We want to give you an update on current concepts and recent advancements in the field. And we also want to have you more equipped to deal with some of the more difficult shoulder cases. So hopefully if you have a difficult shoulder case that comes in, you won't feel like this. This is, uh, this is my four-year-old going on a roller coaster for the first time. And uh, you know, hopefully t you'll have uh, more confidence, uh, more knowledge, uh, and feel a little more prepared after today's event to deal with some shoulder conditions. So uh, we will proceed with... Uh, Getting going, we're going to start with session one, which is uh, shoulder instability, and that will be moderated by Dr. Yates Dunaway. Welcome to the first session of Oscar Miller Day. Our first session, as uh, Natty said earlier, will be on shoulder instability. We'll have three presentations and then a question and answer session. Our first presenter is Dr. Dana Paisaki, member of our Shoulder and Elbow Sports Center. His topic is uh, enter shoulder instability, current approach. Welcome, Dana. Good morning. I have no disclosures. Uh, traumatic anterior shoulder instability is a condition uh, in the orthopedic community that we know pretty well in terms of natural history. We know, for instance, that recurrence rates are highly dependent on age, gender, and we now know <clears throat> much more about associated bone loss, which Matt Prevention will talk to us about a little bit later on the glenoid as well as on the humeral side. 
We also know that over time, recurrent dislocations are not great for the joint. One of the better studies in the orthopedic literature in general is Hovelius' JSCS 2009 prospective study over 25 years, which showed that a few dislocations will cause some damage to the joint, but the real penalty is to have chronic instability of the shoulder over the course of your life with well, upwards of a 40% rate of arthropathy. Uh, we've also learned, unfortunately, that non-surgical treatment options really don't work too well. We know, for instance, that internal rotation bracing, also from Hovelius, uh, does really nothing more than simply early, mobilize, uh, early mobilization. External rotation bracing had some brief spurt of optimism back in 2007, uh, but when you really look at the data there, the return to play was fairly low in those patients, and uh, arguably better level one studies after that did not show any real difference. And so the majority of us feel it's appropriate or at least a reasonable option to mobilize patients quickly and the group from Russia has told us that doing so in the middle of a season will be associated with only a moderate degree of recurrence. The current approach to patients who are high risk with respect to uh, sh shoulder instability is usually operative. And the mainstay of the, of the uh, literature suggests that if you address the pathoanatomy, you'll be in a good place. And that pathoanatomy generally comes in, in two main categories. The first is soft tissue. We've known now for 20 years that the essential lesion in anterior shoulder instability is some level of compromise of the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament complex. And this most often involves tearing of the labrum, but also the capsule. And uh, I think it's, it's worth noting that while the majority of patients have a labral tear, we always look for a labral tear. Uh, data back 20 years ago now, which is uh, as relevant now as it was back then, from Lou Bigliani and Dave Alchek in New York suggest that when the shoulder dislocates, the first thing that happens is that the capsule stretches. And the final event is tearing of the labrum. If you cut the labrum by itself, there's very little effect on stability of the joint. And so uh, you need to think about the zone of injury from a soft tissue standpoint as involving both the labrum and the capsule. And any operative approach which addresses the soft tissue pathoanatomy really has to deal with both. We've also learned, particularly over the last five years, that bony uh, pathophysiology is really important here, too. Sugai has told us that hill sacs lesions on the humeral side will occur in 75% of patients, and some level of glenoid bone loss occurs in upwards of 90%. And we've learned from Burkhart and DeBeer back now eight, 10 years ago, that if you have a glenoid that looks like this, where you're viewing the glenoid from above, and the bottom of the glenoid appears narrower than the top, the so-called inverted pair glenoid, which is essentially a compromise of about 30% of the anterior rim of the glenoid, which in the average patient is about four millimeters of bone or less in front of the bare spot, that those patients will have a very high rate of recurrent instability. In contact athletes, the recurrence rates are similar to non-surgical management. On the humeral side, we don't know as much. Uh, Matt Preventer has been one of the few who's written extensively on this. We think that isolated engaging defects of more than about 30% are probably worth paying attention to. And this is really how we measure that uh, amount of involvement as a percentage of the articular arc on the axillary radiograph. Uh, John Sakia sh has shown us in a cadaveric model that about 25% defects probably can be left alone. But if you get up to about 30%, if you don't do something to that defect, uh, a bank art repair alone will probably not work. And we know from additional finite element analysis that these two areas of bone loss on the glenoid and on the humeral side are additive in terms of instability. So having a defect in both places may lead you to intervene earlier, even if the defects are smaller. In general, though, if you remember, about 25 to 30 percent is the cutoff on either side of the joint. That's where you need to start thinking about potentially addressing those issues. We typically get MRIs in these patients, but it's not for the labral tear. You'll often see patients who come in with an MRI from a primary care doc. It's not about the labrum. It's really about the capsule for me. And uh, you don't want to miss this, a, a, a capsular injury of the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament, but off the humeral side, the so-called Hagel lesion, which is shown by the white arrow here, that's present in up to 10% of patients and typically requires an open approach. In older patients, you'll see cuff tears, and you can get a sense for bone loss, but the most accurate modality for assessing bone loss we now know is a CT scan with 3D recons. Uh, we can evaluate the amount of bone loss and quantify it because the inferior glenoid is a nearly perfect circle, which allows us to create CT scan algorithms that essentially plot a circle on the glenoid in a reconstructed digital format. And then you can subtract, basically, what's missing from that circle. 
And we know from a number of studies within the past couple of years that 3D CT scans are warranted. They're more accurate and reproducible than 2D CTs or MRIs. Now, there are two ongoing dilemmas that we frequently see. So any, any consideration of what the current approach to anterior shoulder instability is, we'll typically consider this. The first is, should you stabilize a high-risk athlete after the first dislocation? And secondly, should you address these patients arthroscopically or open? First, with respect to the stabilizing first-time dislocators, Rob Brophy in 2009 wrote a nice systematic review looking at multiple level one studies uh, on, di on treating first-time dislocators with surgery, and he showed uh, a significant risk reduction and optimization of outcome measures, and even the Cochrane database has weighed in on this and suggested that for high-risk first-time dislocator surgery is warranted. But we always have to ask ourselves what the downside is to waiting. And Rob Gourmet, when at Rush, wrote a nice systematic review as well in 2010, looking at patients who had a first-time shoulder dislocation addressed with surgery compared to those who had surgery after several recurrences and found there was really no difference in post-operative recurrence or surgical complications. And we know now from Hovelius' data that a few dislocations after the first event probably does not significantly alter ultimate health of the shoulder from the standpoint of arthritis. And so waiting probably does not cause irreparable joint damage. And when weighed against the alternative, which is operating on everybody who has a first-time dislocation, in which case you'd be operating unnecessarily in a, in a proportion of patients, it favors considering conservative management initially. The conclusion is that it's reasonable to stabilize highest-risk patients after the first event, but there's little downside to waiting till the end of the season so long as the athlete understands the risk of recurrence when going back to play. The one caveat, at least here in North Carolina, would be patients who engage in sports which are potentially life and death. So in my practice, the, it's whitewater kayakers and mountain climbers. You, you either tell those patients, have the surgery or stop doing that activity. And in lower risk patients, it's reasonable to wait and see if recurrence occurs. Now, with respect to the arthroscopic versus open debate, <clears throat> if you look back at the literature, the early series did suggest higher recurrence rates with an arthroscopic approach. But as we've evolved from the standpoint of understanding the pathoanatomy and technically being able to do arthroscopic stabilizations better, we've learned a number of lessons about how to, how to do arthroscopic surgery very well. The first lesson essentially is that you have to address the capsule. You have to mobilize the, the bank heart lesion and the capsule to allow a capsular shift. And you have to address the entire zone of injury, which in the vast majority of patients requires at least three anchors. Less than three anchors has been associated with a higher rate of failure with uh, first-time stabilizations. And this is typically the pattern of anchor insertion at the 6 o'clock position all the way up to the equator. And if you could play these videos, the top video just shows what we look for with respect to uh, mobilizing the capsule and the labrum. You want to make sure you can adequately mobilize that tissue so that it can be translated appropriately. If you just mobilize the labrum, you're probably not going to be doing too much to the capsule. And the bottom picture basically shows that when you shuttle your sutures, you want to do it in a way where when you tie those down arthroscopically, you'll translate the capsule superiorly. So make sure you're, you're thinking about the capsule and the labrum. The glenoid anchors have to be on the, on the rim, not on the neck. So make sure you don't repair it to a non-anatomic position. And this is what a final repair would look like typically, which is shoot forward, looking from the top down on the bottom and from the back forward on the top image there, three to four, sometimes even five anchors if you need them. We also know that you have to address bone loss. Significant bone loss needs to be addressed. I'm not going to go into this in great detail because Matt's going to cover this, but if you think there's significant bone loss on the glenoid side, if there's a bony bank cart, a piece of bone that's broken off, you can either fix that open with screws or arthroscopically, which is uh, something that I typically will do. This is an image of an arthroscopic bank cart repair. If there's no bone fragment left, you've got to get it from somewhere else. And the mainstay approach is probably the latter J procedure which is where the coracoid is transferred on its side to the area of the bone defect. This is an extra articular graft, so the capsule is repaired to the, to the joint surface just in front of the, the graft itself. Iliac crest grafting is an option as well, where the graft is maintained in the joint. Some concern about degenerative changes with this graft, but still a viable option. And then something I think Matt's going to talk about, which is a live, fresh distal tibial osteochondral allograft, which is an exciting option here for patients who have significant uh, bone defects on the glenoid side. On the humeral side, there are a number of studies within the past year or two that have suggested that for 30 to 40 percent engaging defects, a remplissage procedure is a viable option. This is essentially a right shoulder looking at the back. On the upper left, you see the Hill-Sachs lesion. 
and then the infraspinatus on the upper right, and you essentially are placing anchors into the defect <clears throat> and then repairing the tendon into the bone uh, deficiency. And we know uh, from a biomechanical model that 30% uh, defects can be adequately addressed with this combined with a soft tissue bank art procedure, and this is done arthroscopically. There's some concern about decreased external rotation with this approach, but this has not been borne out in clinical studies, and clinically it does appear to decrease recurrence rates. For larger defects, more than about 40%, and this is from Matt Preventure's work, and I'm sure he'll talk about this a bit as well, you can consider osteochondral allografts, either fresh or fresh frozen, level four data suggesting high rates of stabilization, but some increase in complication rates. And then for patients who have more than 40 to 50% compromise, particularly older, less active patients, think about a prosthetic replacement. If you look at the data on arthroscopic versus open stabilizations, modern series now suggest identical recurrence rates if you don't think, if you don't have significant bone loss. So Fabriciani, Batoni, both looking at two to three year follow-up prospective randomized studies suggesting identical recurrence rates. And Rob Brophy wrote another systematic review suggesting <clears throat> if you look at the same age range, open versus arthroscopic techniques, both fixed with anchors, that there's no difference in clinical outcome measures or recurrence rates. And so the conclusion is that outcomes should be equivalent with either an arthroscopic or an open approach so long as you're adequately addressing the pathology. It's, it's less about the length of the incision and more about addressing what's inside. For me, I open if there's any pathology I can't appropriately address through the camera. So significant bone loss, haggle lesions, uh, as well as soft tissue deficiency, which is just something I can't do through the scope. So in summary, the chief goal of treatment here is to minimize recurrence while maintaining the patient's activity level. Non-surgical treatment does not alter recurrence significantly, and early mobilization and return to play is acceptable in many patients. Surgical treatment is indicated in patients with a high risk of recurrence, and the best results can be expected if all relevant pathoanatomy is addressed. Uh, many of you are familiar with our next speaker. Uh, Don D'Alessandro has been instrumental in North Carolina for years, developing the Shoulder and Elbow Center and Sports Medicine Center. Uh, Don's topic today is shoulder, uh, posterior shoulder instability. It's more common than you think. Thank you, Yates. Nice to see everybody here. I'm always going to remember today Mike Wattenbarger. For the first time in my life, I was referred to as a godfather and also a grandfather. Thank you for that, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, this is an interesting topic to me uh, as it's really evolved over the course of my career, how well we've been able to recognize posterior instability where we missed it many times before. These are my disclosures. Um, we get a lot of support for our fellowship, so I guess I'm conflicted in many ways here today. Um, the introduction relates to the fact that when I was coming through, we missed posterior instability all the time. And we didn't really understand it. We didn't, the literature wasn't very good to help us understand uh, how to make the diagnosis, much less how to fix it. So the non-anatomic repairs that were proposed had poor outcomes, 50% failure rates. Then we did things like humeral osteotomies and glenoid osteotomies, but we really weren't fixing the pathoanatomy. So with the introduction of the arthroscope, we certainly began to learn and understand the pathoanatomy better and how to fix it better. And consequently, our anatomic results ended up with better clinical results. I'd say today in my practice, it is a referral practice, but still, I'd say 50% of the instability cases I do in a year are on posterior instability now. And so I know there was many times that it saw me, but I did not see posterior instability in the first decade of my career. So hopefully we can go through a few uh, tricks today to how to pick, pick up on it. Um, as far as the classification, we're going to hit a little bit on traumatic dislocations first, and then the majority of the talk will be on the recurrent subluxator or dislocator that we see as mostly presenting as our overhead athletes. Uh, in terms of the traumatic dislocations in the literature, if people show up in the emergency room, 50% of the time this diagnosis is missed. Two mechanisms, a direct blow such as this, but really the most common mechanism is an indirect uh, force driving the, posterior, the head posteriorly. Uh, certainly there's that subset of folks that have seizures, convulsions, um, electric shock that we'll see bilateral sometimes, posterior instability. Don't rely on your x-rays from the emergency room, right? Uh, there are always poor views. A straight AP of the shoulder, this patient, you, it was missed. And here is the trauma series. An AP of the scapula clearly shows the overlap of the head on the glenoid. And the axillary view is essential for assessing 
uh, not only the Hill Sachs lesion, but also maybe glenoid hypoplasia or glenoid retroversion. So reduction is kind of simple if it's a, a small Hill Sachs and reverse Hill Sachs, and most of the time the patient has done it themselves, and I think that's why a lot of times it's missed, because they don't really realize it was out of joint. The reduction is relatively simple. The gunslinger, is, some type of uh, external rotation brace is useful. The literature does not tell us how long to immobilize it, just like Dana was talking about with anterior. So probably keep them in about three or four weeks. Recurrence rates are really unknown. I think mostly it relates to the person's activity level. If it's an offensive lineman or someone going back to benching and lifting, it's probably going to be a very high, if not pretty much guarantee, they're going to have continued troubles. So how about the operative management? It's based solely on the size of the reverse Hill Sachs lesion. So if it's a small defect like this, you can manage this now arthroscopically uh, or through a small rotator interval approach. Um, what you'll do is you can fix the bank heart post uh, arthroscopically, which is nice, and then either do a remplissage, reverse re remplissage, if you will, bringing the subscap into that defect arthroscopically, or you can do it quite easily through a rotator interval deltopectoral approach. So here's an acute bank heart lesion in a college football player that we repaired, and uh, he did very well uh, after that. Now let's say the hill sacs is bigger, 20 to 40 percent. Um, you can just use suture anchors now to bring the subscap into that defect, and it's a very nice, easy way to do uh, basically a modified McLaughlin procedure. We're all familiar with Dr. Neer's initial approach to this, which was to take the lesser tuberosity off and transfer it into the defect. I'd say that's probably of historical value now because he didn't have suture anchors like we did. And so it's a lot easier to pull that soft tissue into the defect. And of course, if it's greater than 40% in general, the answer is hemiarthroplasty or resurfacing. There is this middle ground, though, in the younger people that have a large hill sacs. We know they're reverse hill sacs. We know they're going to have trouble. You can use osteochondral allografting. The first approach was using femoral heads, very small series. But nowadays, we use um, uh, osteochondral allograft and use some headless screws to replace that anterior humeral defect when it's large. And it's a very helpful thing to have in your armamentarium. Well, how about open reconstructions? When do you need to do open reconstructions? We just talked about bony defects are probably the main reason we end up opening shoulders for posterior instability now, restoring principally the humeral defects. Glenoid defects aren't that common with posterior instability. Certainly, some people will say if it's a failed posterior application or arthroscopic stabilization, that may be a reason to try it open next time, little, add a little more scar tissue, maybe add some scaffolding, uh, uh, dermal matrix or so forth to uh, reinforce that area, but quite honestly, that's a pretty rare bird these days. But when we're about to do um, uh, open surgery, we want to make sure that those results, and, and we've switched to arthroscopic, we want to make sure the arthroscopic results are comparative. And so what we're going to talk about now is recurrent posterior instability in the athlete. Uh, you can think of it as unidirectional or really bidirectional. Occasionally, there's the MDI person where we're going to be doing a pan suture capsulography tightening up the capsule all the way around from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock. So how do we pick up on this in the, in the office? Posterior subluxation is very common. The athlete doesn't come to you saying, my shoulder's going out the back. They feel initial trauma maybe, but not always. It's usually repetitive overhead activities, like um, uh, volleyball is a common one. And then, of course, there's the atraumatic group. They'll complain, as I said to you, of vague discomfort, not really um, coming out. But in terms of the athletes, bench pressing is a big one. If they do a lot of bench pressing and offensive linemen, uh, I'd say probably eight out of 10 offensive linemen with instability are posterior. So if you have that position player coming in to see, with you, see you, think posterior first now. Um, swimmers, obviously. And around this part of the country, the golfers, that left shoulder, I've seen countless golfers with occult posterior instability in that left shoulder, and it hurts them as they come down to strike the ball, and they, it pops back in. It doesn't necessarily come all the way out, but rides out enough that it's symptomatic for them. And so be aware of that in your golfers. The circumduction maneuver, I hope all of you have seen this at some point, is a, a voluntary maneuver that the patient will show you. And they'll bring their arm up, it's out, and then bring it back like this and reduce it back in. And uh, it's basically diagnostic. You don't have to do ask any more questions. It's clear what's going on. Uh, certainly, you want to look for global laxity, a big sulcus sign. Uh, 
Um, remember, though, 50% translation off the back is normal. So compare the other side. And whenever you're examining all your patients, get a sense of that instability. So when that instability patient comes in, you have a feel for what normal translation is. Um, we talked about the x-rays and that normally the version is normal. Uh, glenoid hypoplasia does occur. Your CT scans are helpful for you to deal with that. But I must say, still today, with a little increased retroversion or some hypoplasia, I still attack this arthroscopically first because most of the time that'll work and you don't have to get fancy with bony uh, realignment procedures. This is a very important slide because it talks about the tests you use to help figure this out in the office. The jerk test is what I learned coming through. It's horizontal adduction and you push directly posteriorly. I must say that doesn't help me that much. The Kim test is the one where you come up higher and bring it like this and you can see the shoulder dislocating in and out. This is the more forward elevated position and you can see it out the back and then popping in. And then the load and shift test is more horizontal but then you take the humerus and move it forward and backward. I'd say you need all three of those tests to help you figure this out. Probably of all of them, the Kim test I think is the most helpful to me. And although it was described in the, sup uh, in the sitting position, I like the supine position for that because they tend to relax a little better and you can slide it in and out. So I tend to be able to pick it up the best in that setting. How about operative management? We talked about the opens already. Arthroscopically, the big advantage is we can address, address other pathologies, slap lesions, uh, undersurface cuff fraying, et cetera. But now our goal is to anatomically repair these and get nice bank heart repairs. So before we do arthroscopic, what's the baseline? Well, we originally did this through near shifts where we took the whole infraspinatus off and that's how we got to the posterior capsule. Then in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, we developed techniques where we could go through an infraspinatus split and do a posterior capsulography. And that worked well and we didn't really have to destroy that whole infraspinatus as much. But now certainly the mainstay is our arthroscopic approach and we access the posterior capsule through just a portal, not torturing the infraspinatus as much. Well, what does the literature say about anatomic repairs of open capsulorophies? These are really the five big studies that people talk about. And the gold standard here, the average series size was about 25 patients. And the bottom line is it works about 92% of the time, the anatomic capsular open surgery. So if we're going to do arthroscopic surgery, we've got to reach this level of success or we should be doing them open. So how has arthroscopic stabilization evolved? Uh, I don't know how many of you remember Dick Casperi. He was a real wizard of an arthroscopist, put multiple sutures through a drill hole in the glenoid and uh, only he could do it. And that was really in the 90s. He was way ahead of his time. So we chose an easier way and for a while a lot of us did thermal shrinkage and unfortunately we proved that that was not a good idea and is still not a good idea. And, but now the te suture application techniques have really helped us placing sutures, mobilizing capsule, and like Dana said, I can't remember doing a poster application with less than four or five anchors. So you should be putting a lot of anchors in. If it's posterior, it should go from about five o'clock to 10 o'clock to get that whole capsule up. Two or three anchors just won't do it for uh, posterior instability. Well, how are the results? Here are the five most common. Matt Preventure, our guest speaker, had an important paper in this group. And if we look at arthroscopic stabilization, about the same number of patients per series and their results are 90%. So they're comparable now to the open approaches. This paper is an important one to, to single out. Jim Bradley is a real leader in posterior instability surgery. This is the largest series in the literature, 200 cases, 90% success. The two points that come out of, of Jim's paper are number one, contact athletes did just as well as non-contact because there was a while there that we pr proposed do arthroscopic for everybody except the contact athlete. You still have to do it open. This study pretty much seals it up that we can do contact athletes arthroscopically as well with success. The other thing that he pointed out is in the beginning, we used to do just labral plasties, grab the capsule to the labrum and not put anchors in. And the success rates in his series were not quite as good when we can create a nice bumper like that bottom picture, bring that bumper up and bring that capsule up. This is one caveat, though, that we need to be aware of. If you have a thrower who has posterior instability, which is not common, right, because many throwers have tight posterior capsules, but in those throwers that do, your success return to throwing, this paper tells you, isn't guaranteed, and it's something you're going to want to tell 
that overhead thrower. Uh, only 55 percent in this paper were able to get back to their same level of throwing, which is important. A couple of comments on surgical technique for the you orthopedists out there. You need two posterior portals, one to pass, one to collect your sutures. The posterior inferior accessory portal is essential. That first anchor can easily go at 6 o'clock from the posterior and maybe even somewhat across that. And the first one, though, you don't get quite as great a bumper because there isn't much labral tissue straight at the bottom of the glenoid. But as you work your way up, you keep on passing your sutures between your posterior capsules, and you can create a nice bumper on that posterior glenoid. The last thing I like to do, and it's not universal, but we've left a big hole there with that accessory portal, which is adjacent to our capsule orifice one centimeter away. So I do like to close the posterior portal. Sometimes in the MDI patients, I'll put two or sometimes three sutures through that posterior capsule to grab that inferior capsular um, uh, sling up a little bit better. A few more uh, conceptual questions. The Kim lesion, I think, is really important to understand. As opposed to the anteriors that usually have a bank heart where it's torn off, many times posterior instability will have something called a Kim lesion, which is an erosion of that posterior labrum. It's not separated off. There's a crack in the labrum, and it's kind of peeled down. And we talk about loss of the chondral labral height in that case. And the important part of that is to recognize it and not just bring the capsule up, but to mobilize that labrum and bring the whole bumper up to improve your success rates. So Kim lesion is an important thing to consider. And then the last sort of question that sort of disappeared, I noticed that Dana really didn't even have to mention it, was the rotator interval closure. What's happened to our rotator interval closures? Well, the open series never closed rotator intervals, but their success rates were pretty good. Um, excellent scope results you've just seen without touching the rotator interval. And then what closed the door was uh, another paper by Matt Preventure. Uh, a couple of biomechanical studies which showed that closing the rotator interval does not affect posterior translation. So you don't have to think about that at all for posterior instability. So in summary, it's much more common than you think. Look for it and you'll find it. Uh, the arthroscopic procedures, even in contact athletes, have been very successful. On occasion for the small reverse hill sacs, you can do an arthroscopic um, McLaughlin procedure. And open surgery is really reserved for restoring the bony defects in the U.S. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. We're fortunate to have Dr. Matt Preventure here as our keynote speaker for the first session. Dr. Preventure is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and Dartmouth Medical School. He completed his residency at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego and fellowship at Rush University. He has served as a team physician for SEAL Teams 1, 3, 5, and 7. He is currently Chief of Sports Medicine Service at Massachusetts General Hospital at Harvard University. He is internationally known for his expertise in shoulder instability. Uh, we are looking forward to this presentation on failed shoulder instability and glenoid bone loss. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, everyone. It's a, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, really thoroughly impressed with uh, this society. Oscar Miller Day and the, and the uh, institution here and, and your research foundation. I want to thank everyone for the kind invitation and hospitality. It's been a, been a wonderful trip. So these are my uh, disclosures. They're also on the Academy website uh, if you care to look at them further. So just a little bit about me. I grew up in New Hampshire. Like, why San Diego back to Boston? And uh, a couple people asked me last night they're going to get a head CT scan at some point on me. But I grew, I grew up back east in New Hampshire. and. Uh, family is from there. I spent some time in Japan in the Navy and then uh, deployed. This is our Navy Medical Center in San Diego. Where's Dr. Crickard? I think our parking spot is out there somewhere. The parking spot's about a half mile from the hospital because San Diego, the parking is terrible. It's that triangle denotes our parking spot. Uh, this was my job on the ship. I was uh, assigned to the Mercy ship the last four years and uh, this was my job on the ship, which is uh, the surgical services director, but that was a pretty cool parking spot. I kept thinking I was going to drive in the water every day. And this was uh, part of our mission in Tobelo, Indonesia, but we go out about five, five and a half, six months and uh, prepare for, I guess, the next disaster. And it really was an incredible mission with about 1,200 people, half of a military population and half were civilian volunteers through a, a lot of uh, non-governmental organizations. So it was a lot of uh, fun. And what do uh, board uh, docs and therapists and other folks on the, uh, on the ship do? Uh, well, one of the uh, trips we found, uh, 
a time to go to the 37th annual Darwin Beer Can Regatta. So we spent July 4th, 2010 in Darwin, and we said, well, I know we can build a, uh, if you can go back, I know we can build a uh, beer can regatta, but it's not really beer can on a ship. As you can see, Mountain Dew was the uh, soda can of choice uh, on our ship, and uh, we had a number of engineers and some fine Indonesian epoxy that helped us build this uh, vessel while we were out there. We had craned, the, uh, craned it off the ship, here it is here, it's big enough, and then uh, there's our final vessel at the, uh, at the Darwin Beer Can Regatta. Just, just look at that boat with the mallet on it, it's pretty impressive, but these Australians take it very seriously. We were the first American entry, we took fifth place and uh, got a, a beer can award, it was pretty interesting. So anyway, my, uh, this is my current job, uh, the Red Sox lost last night, unfortunately it kept me up too late, but I'm um, in Boston, Massachusetts. And this has been a real passion of mine because I made, I think, many mistakes along the way and uh, probably didn't do the right thing with our patients in the past. But I think we're getting better at this. We're getting smarter. And this is a topic that has really garnered a lot of interest in the last 10 years. So we're going to talk about some of the mechanics, looking at this ahead of time, knowing how much is enough. And this is still a challenging question. And then finally, some treatment strategies. This is a, a typical injury. This is the Beijing Olympics and a weightlifter. And uh, you can see this is a very common uh, injury. And fortunately, I've had some very good people uh, in front of me that have taught, taught me a lot about instability in the uh, military. And I can tell you, <laughs> this is a, gotta love Beijing. There's a lot of uh, really great leaders that have taught me a lot about this. Well, how to stay out of trouble. And this is really a failed instability talk, but I'm gonna focus on glenoid bone loss and humeral head bone loss as really the number one reason for failure of instability. If you go back only about 13 years, this was really the first time this was recognized with uh, Burkhardt and others, where they looked at South African rugby players, 194 uh, patients, and if you had an inverted pair glenoid, in other words, you lost a little bit of that bone, you had a miserable recurrence rate, 60%. But look at this, if you did not have a bone defect, you had a 4% recurrence, so that's great. And that was suture anchor repair back in the 1990s. That's an incredible outcome that I would still like to have today. Well, how do we stay out of trouble? And the reason why Burkhardt and De Beer knew this is that only takes a little bit of bone loss to get a pretty significant damage to the glenoid. So five or six millimeters can be 20 or 25 percent. And uh, Dana Piasecki put together a great JAOS uh, article with me that reviewed this uh, very well. The importance of these bony defects are that they are the vast majority of instability failures. And if you look at Pascal Ballot's work, he calls this the number one, number two, and number three reason for surgical failure. And in France, they just have less failures because there, if you dislocate, you get a latarge for the most part. So in my opinion, when we're starting to look at these patients with instability, you should go not worried about their soft tissues. You know they have a Bankart tear. Maybe they have a Hagel tear, as Dana showed. But do they have bone loss? And this is what we have to be concerned about. So this, why is this important? Pretty basically, it uh, lessens the shear arc and safe arc through which this uh, humerus can resist translation. And that's what's called the inverted pair glenoid. Well, how do we know about it ahead of time? I think you can really tell this with a good couple minute focused history and physical examination. And what we're gonna show here is that laxity does not equal instability. So instability is a clinical diagnosis and we have to know what type of instability it is before surgery. Just like Don showed, posterior instability is a clinical diagnosis and we know they're posterior, we know we're going to take care of that ahead of time from clinical examination and history, just like anterior and MDI. And so that's the most important. We've actually uh, just published on this, but you can predict bone loss from exam and instability. And if you have bone loss, this is your typical examination pattern. You don't have to bring the arm all the way up in that abducted external rotated position, but you get instability in mid-abduction, signifying that the capsule and tissues are really taking a hit, and you can identify this. The other things you can identify is high energy mechanisms, uh, ease of recurrence, shoulders now coming out in their sleep, multiple instability episodes, or young age when this first came out. A chronic instability pattern also can signify this. Well, how much is enough? We've done a lot of work on this uh, at the Navy where we have a really uh, excellent system to capture almost 100% of our radiographic data. And so we've looked at this uh, extensively and found that you know, x-rays are good, but in 2013 it's probably not adequate to assess and make really good bona fide clinical decisions. MR arthrogram is actually pretty good. MRI is okay, but you can see the arthrogram fluid surrounds us very nicely. So if you're concerned about uh, radiographic exposure, MR arthrogram can really help you out looking at the bone loss. And here's a really good picture of an attritional defect, almost about 30% on the MR arthrogram. 
One thing I'd caution you is uh, we, we looked at this is just looking at the axial CT scan and if I do get a CT and if you do put your patients uh, to get the extra radiation exposure that you get a 3D, uh, 3D sagittal oblique with the humeral head digitally subtracted. And here you can see here's the axial CT that corresponds to the uh, image on the right. And what we found was that if you actually measured this out and looked at this closely, you actually had double the amount of bone loss versus what you could find on an axial CT. So if you're at all concerned, some level of advanced imaging based on your history and examination should help you make that decision. And I preferentially obtain either a CT scan or MR arthrogram in a known anterior instability event. That's going to help me make my decision-making process. Here's another example of some of these uh, 3D digital subtractions. Here's a bony fragment, and there's a significant attritional loss, almost at the 45, maybe 50%. And this inferior two-thirds is a well-conserved circle, as Etoy and Huseman's have shown us. And here's how clinical bone loss occurs is, although it's been studied in the lab in the past to this 45-degree angle, it's really not how it occurs. And understanding that bone loss occurs in the glenoid parallel to the long axis of the glenoid, and you can see there's a, a very typical uh, example. So we uh, worked on this, and here's a classic example of how bone loss and bone injury occurs is parallel to the long axis of the glenoid. So not all bone loss is the same type, and this is some recent work we, we just uh, submitted for the academy, but not all bone loss is the same. And so you have bone loss, and now my next question is, well, what type is it? And these are all different patients. These have different characteristics, different presentations, but you can see we had a database of about 300 CT scans of patients with anterior instability. We went through those, and you can see an acute fracture was only 5% of the time. The vast majority were in this partial resorption. You can see that that bone in the middle does not comprise the whole glenoid. So something's going on here. The bone is either resorbing, uh, there's a vascular insult, something else going on. And these fully attritional is actually 10 or 11% of the patients. So you're dealing already for the vast majority in patients with more than one instability episode, a recurrent instability that have some bone loss. I personally think it's too late to know once in the operating room. This is probably my biggest mistake in the past is I would get in there, I'd put the scope in, and Burkhart showed us how to measure all this. I'm like, okay, now what? I've got a lot of bone loss, and I'm in the lateral position, which is how I love to do instability surgery. Now do I convert it to the beach? Do I do a ladder J? So I like knowing all of this ahead of time so that I can have a really good discussion with our patients. And the bottom line is you can't, in, at least in my prior population, uh, a SEAL or a Marine that's jumping out of a perfectly good airplane at, at 20,000 feet just cannot dislocate. And so those may be different discussions based on your patient population. And maybe that football player uh, that's playing college or looking at scholarship, they can't dislocate. And maybe you want to think about this algorithm based on their characteristics and talk to the patients at length about this. In addition, I think we need to do a better job communicating. It's not only talking about what type of bone loss we have, but what type of labral injury. And so uh, people will tell me, well, they have a, a bank heart tear. My next question is, well, what type of bank heart? And not all bank hearts are the same. We have to be very clear about this. If we're going to be able to put data together in systematic reviews and convince our payers that we are doing the right thing for our patients, we have to be very clear. And I would submit to you that we are a little bit of our own worst enemy because we have not done a great job. And I would look closely at all of your own specialties in terms of how we're communicating and putting this data together. So this is a soft tissue bank art, but this has also been called a bank art in the literature, and this is a huge bony piece, and it's really unfair to lump, lump both of these patients together in a systematic review and an outcome analysis. Why do I have the Alps tear in here? This is a glenoid bone loss injury. Well, this is a great example of an Alps tear. There's the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Alps is an anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion. In other words, the capsule just heals medially down the glenoid neck, and you can see it displaced. There's a large majority of instability patients that have had just two episodes that end up like this. Well, why are we all concerned about this? My partner, J.P. Warner, looked at this, and he had a higher number of failure. He had three times the failure rate of instability surgery done arthroscopically if you just had an Alps tear, and you're like, that's pretty concerning. So we wanted to next ask if Alps tear could be associated with glenoid bone loss. And so we looked at our database, and we found, sure enough, that if you had an Alps tear, guess what? You also had twice the amount of glenoid bone loss. Although it wasn't huge, 10, 11, 12, 13 percent, it may be enough and maybe another factor in addition to capsular issues that could be going on to have not a good a result with the Alps tear. So be careful if you see that patient with the Alps tear, and you may want to think about doing something else. What about treatments? We went back to a, a database in about 2003 to 2006, and we identified about 20 patients. They had 25% loss, and 
No, oh, we're doing great. We had 13% failure, much better than Burkhart's 61%. You know, we followed him for three years. Yeah, we're not as dismal as previously reported. Well, what was interesting about this is the bony bank card, if you had a bony piece on some level, those groups didn't fail. If you had attritional loss, in other words, you were relying on soft tissues, that was our entire failure group. What I can tell you now, and I need to publish this again, is that this failure rate is now much higher. We're probably in the 40 or 50% range of instability failure most of them still in that attritional loss group. So the 13%, there's nothing like long-term outcomes to ruin a good day, but that 13% is much higher. And again, I think these patients do very well for a couple years, and then they start to fall off a cliff. And that's been a very typical practice pattern for me. So what about the Bristow and Latarge? And I think this has seen a huge resurgence in the United States, uh, obviously identified overseas. And this is basically what you get. It's been around in, in Europe if you have an instability procedure, uh, instability injury. The Latarge is a, becomes an extra articular platform, acts as an extension of the arc of the glenoid. But there's about 20 different ways to do this procedure. We went back to the Naval Academy when Jay Cox was there in the 1970s. And if you were a midshipman of the Naval Academy playing football or lacrosse and you dislocated, you got a Bristow, which is really just a, a smaller version of the latter maybe one screw. And what was great about this is through our Naval Academy network, we were able to get 90% follow-up at about 26 years. And it was really a pretty cool study bringing these patients back and see how they did. And they all had to go through military training. A lot of them were pilots or Navy SEALs, all officers in the military. The overall recurrence was 14%, but what was remarkable to me were the scores. 90% of normal or better on most of these outcomes. Even a WOSI score, which is very hard to do well on WOSI. These patients were doing actually quite well. So Jay Cox had this figured out in the 90s, and we may have lost our way a little bit. And Hovelius, I'd be remiss if I did not mention him and his incredible work where he has this group in Scandinavia of patients that just never leave, and 118 now at 20 years. Uh, but you can see they, uh, the satisfaction overall is very good but there's still a concern of arthropathy and we don't know which is first just with the dislocation does it cause arthropathy or is it the procedure itself and uh, if you look at Hovelius's data those that had improperly placed bone blocks even if it was one to two millimeters proud did much worse also I'd be remiss if I had not mentioned Jill Walsh who has more than 2,500 latter J cases and his recurrence rate is less than two percent so you have to really look closely at this uh, here's some work out of Mayo Clinic with uh, a, a group from Japan that was studying there as well as uh, John Sperling. But it was a very important study and I think makes us look at what we do in each of our specialties. But the latter J was around for 50 years. So if there's something that's developed in Europe or overseas, rest assured it's probably not tested too well. So this procedure was around for 50 years but no biomechanical testing whatsoever until this was done at the Mayo Clinic in about 2008. So 1954 to 2008, everyone was espousing the sling technique of the latter J, the conjoint tendon, the sling, the pouch, everything working well. But it was quite some time before we had that data. And exactly right, as John and his colleagues have shown us, that the stabilizing mechanism of that conjoint tendon is actually quite good through that subscap split and an important, uh, an important thing as demonstrated here. And here's a classic example of a failed anterior stabilization now with augmentation of the latter J in a patient that did very well. However, it's not a benign procedure and there's still many issues with the latar J. It's non-anatomic by definition and causes a, a lot of scar. Yes, uh, Rich Hawkins and many others who've done a lot of these he says, every day I struggle with this case and it's very hard to manage the capsule, the conjoint, and get this exactly right. These are all cases, uh, most of them are mine, a couple were referred in, but uh, the bottom middle one with that uh, coracoid pulled off was a SEAL guy that went back and started doing uh, about 50 dips at three weeks out and uh, there's just <laughs> nothing you can do about that. But I can tell you it's a miserable revision, uh, it's a very tough scar. Resorption of latter J, it absolutely exists. So when we're asked about bone and incorporation here, on average, 57%, 57% of the coracoid is lytic after a latter J. And it's a great study by Di Giacomo out of Italy that was just published recently. We also have arthrosis concerns, but again, it's hard to uh, stand the test of time here, which has been excellent. I would caution you technically about small caliber, less than 3.5 millimeter cannulated screws. I use solid screws, uh, 3.5 or 4.0, as you can see that can happen. So is there an optimal way to place the bone block? I'm gonna say, is there a way we can get better about doing this procedure? Can we help reinvent the latter J? Traditionally, it's the lateral edge. You cut the coracoid and you bring it down and the lateral edge is the, uh, is the face. 
And here you can see that lateral edge. There's a lot of ways to attach the capsule with sutures, anchors, uh, suture washers. But the newer Latrage, in other words, Burkhart and De Beer anecdotally noted, if you flip it 90 degrees, it becomes concave. There's more bone to work with, and it just fit better. So we said, OK, can we provide a more congruent joint? And we noted that we also were looking at ability to have uh, grafts. And I had a fresh glenoid graft on order for probably a year and a half, and I couldn't get it. There's a lot of uh, harvest concerns and donor concerns about getting fresh glenoids after, after uh, cadaver harvest. So I asked, well, what don't you use? And they said, well, we process a lot of tali, but we throw away a lot of distal tibias. I'm like, oh, distal tibias, it's, conca it's concave, maybe it'll fit. And so here's an unmatched specimen uh, that they uh, sent to me. These are two different specimens. You can see amazingly how well the, how well the uh, body is conserved across joints. So we started to uh, study this a little bit better. We looked at some of the coracoid anatomy versus uh, the distal tibia, as well as the iliac crest and many other things. And here you can see a study we did looking at placing the latter J, both the inferior position on the left side, which is how Burkhart and De Beer advocated it. You can see it fits very well, much better than the lateral congruency of the latter J. And you can also see iliac crest bone graft that did very well. We looked at some uh, additional topographic mapping studies, looked at cartilage thickness. Here you can see glenoid and tibia. We also looked at this with iliac crest and some of the other graphs that have been utilized uh, for bone. And then I uh, did my first case in July of 2008 after we finished all this work and uh, consented a, a patient uh, that was demonstrated here. He was a football player, he was 18 years old, had multiple instability episodes, easier in sleep. Uh, you didn't even almost have to get the CT scan. You knew that he had a very large bone injury. Uh, this is a very hard distal tibia bone, osteochondral. This is back in the day when I used to do ankle scopes, but I'm flipping it upside down and it almost looks like a shoulder. Now the uh, talus is on top and the, uh, yeah, the talus is on top and the uh, distal tibia is on the bottom after I've uh, flipped it upside down. Um, Ankle folks don't make fun of me here, but this uh, I've long I've long given up ankle surgery. But you can see it almost looks like the it looks like a, a shoulder joint there. So, hence the uh, hence the rationale for at least uh, trying to start with this. We've started working on some arthroscopic methods to pass the uh, pass the graft and fix the graft. And there's also a lot of work being done uh, concurrently in Europe and Asia, looking at iliac crest from an autograft standpoint, which is also an excellent option. So here's that patient now. I uh, probably got the bone up a little high, but uh, here's a couple other patients here now at 24 months that are showing pretty consistent healing. I'm not here to advertise this. Uh, I think it's still investigational. We're still collecting the data, and I should have it uh, by this winter uh, from a CT scan and outcomes perspective. Uh, and here's a patient here through a subscap split at uh, 18 months. Uh, very good military patient, left, right, up, down. So last, in the last couple minutes, I just want to briefly touch on Hill Sachs. I think this is an exciting area, and it gets a lot of attention these days with remplissage or filling the defect with soft tissue. And where do these occur? It's, it's in, not really in the bare spot area, but it actually is up on the cartilage in the posterior lateral aspect of the humeral head. If you're looking at an axial CT or axial MRI, it's almost your first or second cut from the top. First or second cut from the top is where you run into this thing. And so there's this concept of engaging versus non-engaging. And if you look at this, they felt the size was not important, Burkhardt and De Beer. But at some point, all hill sacs engaged and has been really described as the best predictor of what to do. Well, the problem is, am I not just am I not pushing the shoulder hard enough? Is the patient not relaxed enough? You know, these all engaged at some point, but are they, I guess, easily engaging? And so I think the concept we really have to think about is I've talked a lot about glenoid, but engagement is made much easier with bipolar bone loss. In other words, glenoid bone loss makes the humeral head much easier to engage. And Below was uh, into this in 2010 when he looked at the instability severity index score. And I think this is where we need to go in the future, although there's certainly some issues with this score and already the ISIS-2 score has been postulated because of what are, the, what are some of the issues with this. And so if you look at some of the categories, uh, a score of three or more recommended a bone procedure. Well, what's very interesting about this is your recurrence rate increased dramatically as you went above three. You can get to hit three points very easily. Your age, less than 20, gives you two, and then a type of sport, contact. They completely took out bone injury and everything else, so it's not 100% applicable to all of our populations, but is a good idea of some of the things we think about in order to get a successful outcome. So this is a bipolar problem that I will submit to you, and this is a big issue, and we can look just at the hill sacs or just at the glenoid, 
But looking at this more scientifically, I think, is where we're going in the future. And just want to give you a preview of this. This is Yamamoto's work looking at the glenoid tract that takes into account this bipolar issue. We went back and looked at our instability procedures over a couple years. And what we found is we could very easily predict what Burkhart called engagement uh, more than 90 percent of the time based on radiographic measures when we went back and looked at this database. The other thing we're looking at is looking at how to grade these hill sacks in a three-dimensional fashion. A lot of these have been looked at from a prism or a uh, rectangle uh, fashion, and it's the best radiographic study, if you go back, is from Carter Rowe in 1984, which is a plain radiograph, as well as Richards looking at the articular size. Well, that's not really helpful for us to figure out exactly what to do for our patients, and it hasn't been well correlated with anything to do for the hill sac. So we're starting to look more at the volume and the actual hill sac size as well as the location of the hill sac. So both volume and location are becoming important. What's also important, and again goes back to bipolar, is glenoid bone loss is proportional to size of the hill sacs. And you can see that with increasing hill sacs, you get more glenoid bone loss. So if you have a big hill sacs or vice versa, be thinking about both. So how do these happen? In addition to our database, we found that more bone loss, more glenoid loss, more hill sacs injuries come with more time of injury. Bone and other factors are very important, and we're looking at this uh, in the future in terms of our prospective database. Don, I was glad to get some video of you uh, here down at the uh, SEAL base going through the, uh, this thing's called the Weaver. So. I think when looking at this, it's, uh, the hill sacs is an orange slice, not a prism. It exists very high in the humeral head, and it's the bipolar problem that we need to start addressing in the future. The good news is I think uh, we can address this mostly from glenoid-based strategies. It's the rare case that we're just looking at the humeral-based strategies. Although remplissage has confused this a little bit, we still have some emerging data coming out on this. And I think if you're looking at this from a bipolar fashion, these numbers are going to continue to decrease for me just on the size of the glenoid. If you have this hill sac, that these numbers are continuing to go down for me to consider open type of procedures. I want to thank these guys on the left. They've been extremely helpful in helping me formulate what is a, a reasonable algorithm for treating uh, some of these patients. And then I guess a shameless ad, but it's really the contributors that helped us here, such as Jill Walsh and many others. I, I reference this all the time and open it up, but it's a, a great book on instability and looking at Jill Walsh's latter day chapter has uh, been very helpful for me. So again, thank you very much for your kind attention. It's a great pleasure to be here. That's great, Matt. Thanks. Uh, there's a question or two from the audience. Uh, we can take that. Um, I had a, a couple of questions. Uh, what position do you guys do your shoulder instability in and, and why? Don? Um, I still do. Um, I still do it in beach chair, and as you saw from those photos, we're able to get to what we need to do posteriorly. I must admit, though, I have uh, good assistance that gives some traction to me, uh, and so I think it can be done in the beach chair. I'd say probably the majority of the people use lateral these days. So I'm, I'm a uh, I'm a hybrid guy. I uh, will do it lateral if it's arthroscopic. But as Matt suggested, it's a little bit tricky to do a ladder J lateral. So I try to plan and know before I get in there. If I'm going to do it open, I do it beach chair. If, I, if I'm doing something arthroscopically, I'll do it lateral. So Yates, I know that this was not a, a planted question, but it's a very interesting transition to me back to the East Coast, where the vast majority is in the beach chair position, where West Coast was lateral. We just finished a study looking at a, a meta-analysis of shoulder instability fixed arthroscopically in the beach chair. And we looked at the, the one variable was beach chair position versus lateral decubitus. Beach chair position instability procedures are about 3,400 procedures total, almost evenly split between the two groups. Beach chair position had twice the recurrence rate. And uh, we, just, we just got that into the academy this year. It'll be, I'm sure it'll be pretty interesting <laughs> when we present it. But it's just it's the data that out there. It's pretty, it was a pretty interesting finding. Question here? Yeah, good morning. Question for Dr. Preventure. How are you handling the capsule in your distal tibial allografts? Are you using anchors, and if so, which ones? Little technical tr tricks. Yeah, so uh, ways to fix the capsule anteriorly. And again, this is the problem with the tibia is that there's no conjoint tendon. Uh, the John Sperling uh, Mayo Clinic sling we've been shown knows very well, it works very well now. Uh, I use sutures underneath washers on the screws to make it an intra-articular graft. So I put uh, number two suture underneath the washers and repair the capsule. So I take the capsule down as uh, 
far possible down the glenoid neck, make it as long as possible, don't touch it on the humerus, and uh, repair it uh, in external rotation about 30 degrees. Thank you. Uh, another question, Matt, in this emerging area of bundled payments and such, uh, are we going to have to do CTs and MRIs on all these shoulder instability patients? Um, you, you know, that, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I, and, uh, you know, as my partner asked me, I, the word value in, at the Boston area is thrown around about every other sentence, and it's, you know, what are you getting out of the value of your case? And I, 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 I don't know yet. Uh, the answer to what your bundled payment's going to be and cover, but it's certainly something to think about. I, my approach to this is I still want to know the data in patients that have the history and examination, goes back to the history and examination, which is pretty cheap, uh, to find out what to do best for these patients. But again, I really don't like getting uh, caught without knowing in the operating room, and that's been probably my biggest lesson learned. That being said, I, if you have an instability event, and you are, have a certain amount of healthcare dollars, I don't necessarily need an MRI or an MR arthrogram. Those are much more expensive. CT scan would suffice it for me, or even just really good x-rays, and if there's no hint of bone loss and they don't have any history of examination, it's like an ACL. You don't need an MRI for an ACL surgery. Thanks. Jim? Yeah, great talks, everyone. I just wanted to ask the panel what their current indications for rim plissage are, and if you do something like a glenoid uh, bone grafting or, or a bone block procedure, do you ever have to address the hill sex as well, or do you just ignore that? Well, I guess uh, I'll start. Um, my thinking has evolved in the last few years. Those last two studies that Matt referenced with no loss of external rotation after remplissage has taken some of the fear away from me doing that. And so in the contact athlete where the hill sex is significant, uh, I have been doing some remplissages small group, but it was basically bi biased by those recent papers. So I, I'm similar. I, I didn't, uh, I started practice um, and really did not do a remplissage ever, uh, but now really the past couple of years I've been Im impacted as well. For me, I'll, I chiefly approach the, the glenoid side first, and then if there's a significant heel sac lesion, usually, I mean, the biomechanical data would suggest 30% or more if it's engaging. I worry about it, I worry about it all the time anyway, and I typically will check to see if it engages after whatever I've done on the glenoid. And I'm thinking about doing a remplissage if it's, again, 30% or more preoperatively. If I do whatever I'm doing on the glenoid, whether it's a bone augmentation procedure or just a soft tissue bank cart, and then I, I check it and I see that there's engagement still and it feels loose, then I'll do a remplissage then. Yeah, I, th this is an area that still confuses me a lot. I, uh, I, I don't know what to do. I, I can tell you I've done two or three remplissages total uh, in my instability population. That's not to say if it's right or wrong, but if there's a hill sax that I'm worried enough about, I, I guess I'm still of the approach that the glenoid side solutions, and almost always you have some level of bone loss, but some level of a bony procedure has been my choice for, the, uh, for this procedure on the glenoid. That being said, there is the rare case, and usually it's the younger patient under age 22 or 23 that has absolutely no glenoid bone loss and a large hill sac. So it may not even be associated with a typical uh, seizure or whatever injury, not even posterior but anterior. Uh, they just have a large hill sac. Some of those I will graft uh, with a fresh, fresh humeral head, but other than that, I, uh, I don't do a lot of remplissage. But I think there's, it's an exciting area and certainly worthy of additional study. A follow-up question for you, Matt, on that is the last year or so in our meetings, when we have a situation when there is a lot of bone loss but on the glenoid side, and there's so many complications with the Bristow from the metal perspective, bone resorption, that we talk about what I call a boneless Bristow, where we just get rid of the bone and transfer the conjoint and fix it with suture anchors or what. What do you think of those, that concept? No, I think, you know, and, and Pascal Below has done a great job with this of advertising the uh, conjoint transfer only or the uh, small bone fleck uh, in, in actually drilling a, a tunnel into the glenoid and fixing it with a, with a screw and uh, emphasizing that the effect of that sling is really good. So there's something, something to be said about that. Uh, again, I don't have all the data. It really begs a, a prospective multi-center type of study to collect data and see what's working. Doesn't even, it's hard to randomize this population, but if you had multi-center groups that could look at this, this is how we're going to answer the question. I think we have time for one more question, John. 
Uh, I guess it's for the whole panel, but uh, Danny, in particular, you, <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, a lot of times uh, with a first-time dislocator, you'll uh, counsel them that they could continue to play, get through the season. What if you got that uh, sort of borderline bony Vancart lesion that it's fresh, and if you do it now, you can actually fix it anatomically? Do you tell them the same thing? Uh, yes, I tell them that we should fix it. We're, that's going to guarantee, give them the best guarantee of a successful result and <coughs> lack well, of recurrence. But if you let them go through the season, is that piece going to look like that? Six oh, if you're asking later. about, in, I'm sorry, I missed the point of the question. Yeah, if there's a, with a month left, I'll let them finish it out in a harness if their position allows them to do that. It's the beginning of the season, I get a little more nervous, particularly if it's a high school player. It's better to fix it when you can before resorption's occurred. Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, and it, I, uh, that pushes me a little bit more towards being a little bit aggressive. If you have somebody who's basically going to end up needing the surgery, uh, uh, probably anyway, if they're a high risk, let's say an 18 year old contact athlete, a rugby or football player with a bony vancart, I usually will tell them you ought to fix this now because the downside, if you wait too long and you get resorption, is probably a, a different surgery, probably a ladder J or something more significant. So I usually will lean more towards doing it, but as Don suggested, it's always a patient specific question. If they have a, you know, a couple weeks left, that's not likely gonna alter things much. I got to tell you, this is probably one of the most stressful cases, i.e. decision making for a lot of us and why it's consistently asked. The, the natural history and data on this, though, is becoming pretty clear. If you wait, there's more instability episodes, especially in this type of player. Uh, there's more bone loss, there's more attrition of the bone, there's more capsule injury, and there's more labral injury, as well as cartilage, GLAD lesions, etc. That natural history has been shown in Scandinavia and some of our data, West Point's data. It's a, it's, it's a tough decision making. I'll, I'll tell you, if it was one of my kids, I'd say, listen, we're, we're going to fix this because there's nothing like that fresh, bony piece to fix and get them back in operation. It is a much different case when that is start to resorb, like I've shown you. And that was 70 plus percent of our population. You have to understand in our military population, many of these folks are waiting a while before they actually get to us uh, in the government system. It takes a little while. We do see the fresh dislocators, they get into us, but it's the ones that are two or three dislocations and you're like, oh, what happened? You know, the bone is now not there. There's a tiny fragment, huge alps of tear. You're already down the algorithm of higher chance of failure.